This is a talk on TensorFlow Haskell API. This is joint work with Frederick, who also did part of this talk, and Greg, who's on the other end of that table. Uh, and this is work that we started uh, while working at Google uh, as a side project, but is now open sourced and on GitHub. So what is TensorFlow? So TensorFlow is an open source library for machine learning. Uh, it was developed by Google. Google open sourced it in late 2015, and it had its 1.0 release a couple months ago. Uh, it's essentially just a graph-based computational framework for distributing computation between different devices and machines. So computations that might span a CPU, a GPU, uh, custom chips like ASICs, and also uh, distributed between multiple machines in a data center, for example. Uh, it's mainly used for building, training, and evaluating neural networks, so both in research and production, uh, for a bunch of different applications like uh, image classification, speech recognition. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a result where they managed to beat top uh, players at the four game Go, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, the, by far, most people are programming TensorFlow in Python. That's the most widely supported and widely used API. But there are other uh, APIs that exist, some supported internally by Google and some from the community. Uh, so for C++, Rust, Java, Go, and we work on the one for Haskell. So why use Haskell for this? So TensorFlow actually has strong type semantics, <coughs> even if uh, languages like Python only let you catch that at runtime. Like TensorFlow doesn't let you say add a vector of ints and a vector of floats together. That gives you runtime error. For Haskell, we should be able to do better. We should be able to catch that compile time so that, for example, if you're scheduling a job on a remote machine, you shouldn't have to wait for that machine to fail and then go and try to get the uh, error logs from that and try to debug what's going on. You should catch that as you're compiling code at the beginning. Uh, and then other standard Haskell benefits apply, like being able to re repack your code more safely and also just distinguish pure and stateful bits of code. So given that Haskell is so great, why use TensorFlow? Why not just write everything in pure Haskell? So uh, TensorFlow has these computational kernels for say adding two things, doing convolutions, uh, various uh, batch operations that are just really well optimized for CPUs, for GPUs, and it lets you interact between those two different devices. Uh, it also uh, native, like kind of transparently supports uh, sending data between different machines which is useful if you're working on a distributed uh, system. Uh, and it has uh, some existing tooling that you can hook into for monitoring, serving, things like that. And it also, if TensorFlow was designed to uh, kind of interact with multiple different languages. Uh, so that's useful if we want to do this stuff in Haskell. And it's also kind of a tantalizing possibility that maybe different languages like we could communicate between each other, like we at Haskell communicate with people who are in Python uh, we haven't really done it yet, but maybe in the future. So this talk will first give an introduction to the kind of basic semantics of TensorFlow using the Haskell bindings. Then uh, we'll give some details of the API and try to talk about benefits of type safety that we can give. And uh, the two main things we'll talk about is how we do graph construction and with our API, which is kind of a mix of pure and monadic stuff. And then uh, talk about how we do type constraints on tensor types uh, using Haskell. And then Frederick will give a code walkthrough and live demo of a simple extension. Okay, so building a really simple TensorFlow graph, we're just gonna add two vectors together. So I'll get to the types a little bit more in the next slide, but for this one, just you have two constant nodes, each of which holds a single fixed vector, and another node that adds them together. And you run the result and you print it, and you just get the addition of those two things. And so the like, vector, for example, is a Haskell function that creates this uh, constant node in TensorFlow. The plus operator creates this add node in TensorFlow. The types look something like this. So run session is the wrapper of pretty much every program. It takes our session monad, which is how you interact with the TensorFlow API, and produces uh, IO. Okay. It's a, the function vector takes some data in Haskell and produces a tensor build float. I'll get into the, what that exactly is in a little more detail, but it's basically a handle into the graph which of data which is of type float. And uh, then these handles are also instances of uh, num, which is why we can add them together. And then there's a run function which, given a handle, will uh, add all those things to the graph, run them, and fetch the results of that execution. 
So this, is, this program is essentially doing a round trip of the data from Haskell into TensorFlow, adding it and then retrieving it back from Haskell and printing the results. Uh, if I haven't said this before, uh, please interrupt me with any questions if you're wondering about stuff. Uh, how come you don't have to declare a type on the second vector? So we get type inference of this. So the plus uh, enforces that the node 2 has the same type as node 1. So you can go further and compose these more and more. That's generally how programs look. So if you want to take the result of the previous thing and say multiply it by three, again, because these tensors are instances of num, we can just use the numeric literal three and the type operator times and just uh, construct another node, which is just the same graph, but with uh, multiplication on top of that, which is referencing another constant, which is just for the uh, type literal three. And running all that gives us three times what was on the previous slide, which is 12. Okay, so, I'm, so not only do we get uh, type inference, we also get type checking. So if we try to enforce maybe explicitly or maybe implicitly from some other code that was using this, that the second node was an int 32, then we would get a compile time check error. And uh, I would say no float and int 32 don't match, uh, which is pretty nice. Uh, as far as I know, we're, me and maybe Rust, I'm not sure, are the only language bindings that do this. Greg is shaking his head that Rust doesn't do this. Uh, and uh, this is, I think, one of the powerful things that using a language like Haskell can do for uh, this type of API. Uh, I should point out, because a lot of people ask this, we only do checking for the values of the tensors, not the dimensions. So for example, if one of these vectors was uh, size five and one was size seven, we're not gonna check that. If one is one dimensional and one is like, two dimensional, we're not gonna check that. Uh, we don't get enough information from TensorFlow either at compile time or even really at runtime to be like certain of that. So we start to figure that out. I think it's also an open question of how you can model that in Haskell in the first place. Question? Yeah. Are your tensors Haskell objects or NFI objects? Are, sorry? Are tensors Haskell objects or NFI like foreign pointers? Uh, they're Haskell objects that sort of reference NFI objects. So it, it's a mix. Um, they're, they're essentially Haskell objects, but the session one add keeps state, which is referencing the NFI objects. So how do we kind of build this whole thing? Well, so TensorFlow individual operations are just linked into the runtime as separate classes. So there's a class for addition, multiplication, convolution, uh, the constant, and those are all linked together into the runtime, which provides functions for creating graphs, for executing graphs, for managing different devices, all that's written in C++, and it's sort of wrapped behind a kind of minimalistic, low-level C API, kind of a lowest common down denominator for all the different uh, languages to uh, interact with, uh, which works well for us because Haskell, it's a lot easier to interact with C code, but the Python, Java, et cetera, APIs are all also using that code. And so our API is structured like this. There's a main core module, which is sort of a low-level API, for constructing graphs, executing them, and interacting with the uh, TensorFlow runtime. Then we generate a single module that has all 600 or so kernels that are linked into TensorFlow minus, I think, one. Uh, that was just too complicated for us. Uh, but we have pretty good coverage, which is really nice. Uh, and uh, then on top of those, we have some extra functionality like gradient for automatic differentiation, ops for some custom things like vector, the function that I showed earlier is written on top of small primitive things, and Q for just message passing between different uh, machines. And in the future, we'd like to build some more high level stuff on top of this. Uh, in TensorFlow, there are libraries like tf, tuck and trip, that learn, or Keras that are kind of do optimization for you. Right now, you sort of have to write that by hand. Uh, so, which for simple examples works okay, but we would, uh, this is uh, what we're going to do in the future. Wait, you have to run optimization by hand, and what about? Oh, so what it is, like, we kind of, uh, so you get gradients, but you have to write the loop of, like, say, fixed step size. Oh, in Haskell, you do it by hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right, so you haven't wrapped TF optimize anyway, because that's, that's a Python level. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah. And this is one of the disadvantages we have. A lot of things with people talking about TensorFlow, they really mean the Python libraries on top of TensorFlow, which we now have to uh, reproduce. So what is this session mode actually doing? So it is uh, constructing a graph uh, by first creating these individual nodes, like addition and const, maybe another const that's adding together. So when we talk to the TensorFlow runtime, 
we need to give these unique names so that it can distinguish, for example, between two cost nodes. And so like maybe one gets pre postpended with a two and then gets postpended with a three. Once we do that, we add those to the TensorFlow graph, we run them, and then we just fetch the results into Haskell data. So the session one basically keeps track of all the bookkeeping for us, uh, both in terms of our like holding on to FFI data we got from TensorFlow and the current graph and this unique identifier. And it's an instance of Mono and also Mono IO. You can like lift arbitrary IO actions into it. So the main type other than session is tensor, which as I said before, is just a handle into the graph. You can think of it as just representing a single dense multi-dimensional array of data. So uh, for example, maybe a two by two matrix of floats or a vector of ints or something more complicated. And so we have two flavors of tensors in our API. So there is like an unnamed node and a named node. Uh, as I saw on the previous slide, there's sort of these two stages. So like they have a constant three, this a priori doesn't have any uh, context associated with it, so we can't give it a name. Uh, and this sort of exposes a slightly unfortunate bit, which is our API is a hybrid. It's kind of uh, when possible, we use these pure unnamed expressions, the tensor builds. But at some points, we need to expose these uh, named values, and we do that through the monadic session API. Uh, Monad is basically lets us come through this uh, kind of identifier and assign things. And so it's very powerful, but it's more awkward than just the pure expressions, which is why we have this hybrid. So if you compare like just having three times x plus y minus one as an expression, that's really easy to read. Even if you raise, replace all the type operators with named things like mol and add, it's still pretty easy to read. When we start trying to write this down, if these were monadic actions, you need these temporary variables. It's much harder to translate that into like the actual formula in your head. Uh, there are combinators like lift a or uh, dollar sign, uh, like the kind of duplicative arrow things, uh, they're, which are a little better, but it's still not as great as if you just do pure expressions. So why do we do things monadically? Well, the way that TensorFlow works, there are graph nodes that need a notion of identity and don't work as pure expressions. So imagine this hypothetical operator truncated normal that given a shape creates a random vector. Okay, so let's take two of these things and subtract them from each other. So let x be some random vector, y be another random vector, and subtract them. Problem is, in Haskell, it is, this is functionally pure exactly the same as let, if x and y were the same thing, let x be something and subtract it from itself. But in the real world, this is not the same thing. If you subtract a vector from itself, you always get constant zero, which is probably not what you want. So representing this uh, truncated normal as a pure thing doesn't actually work. Uh, instead, you need to write it as genetic action, where it takes a shape, it runs in session, and produces a named value. So bind x to some truncated uh, normal of a shape, bind y to some other random variable, and let z be their subtraction. And that's now, because we're in the monad, is distinct from binding x to some truncated uh, normal and subtracting x from itself. Yeah. So kind of Haskell newbie question here. This doesn't feel like a TensorFlow problem per se. This feels like something that's going to show up almost any time you work with playing with random distributions and sampling. You're going to kind of be forced in this monadic world which is you need to draw different samples on different occasions. Is that? Uh, yeah, although the, sometimes uh, that state is passed explicitly, like say the random seed. And right. uh, TensorFlow is sort of letting that statefulness happen implicitly. Right, you can't pass the seeds into TensorFlow. Yeah, uh, so TensorFlow actually marks every kernel with whether or not it's stateful. So we can actually, at CodeGen, tell whether we need to protect it or not with this monadic thing or whether it's something like subtraction that can just be pure. Uh, so it is something inherent in TensorFlow, but we are the only API that uh, kind of needs to worry about this distinct, be really careful about this distinction because we have this like purity <coughs> in the compiler that will optimize things aggressively. Away. Where does it show up a lot besides random random number state? Or is that the main place? Uh, variables and state functions. <laughs> yes. So uh, the uh, yeah, TensorFlow doesn't just have randomness, it actually has state that can persist within an op and change within an operation and can also persist between operations. So there's a variable which uh, operation which creates usual state assign, which takes some uh, value and assigns that to the var variable. So imagine you want to create two of these things and assign them the same thing. Let B be some variable, W be some variable, and uh, assign A and B to 
and assign the same thing and create two other nodes and just run the two assignments. So again, the compiler is completely uh, allowed to optimize that into a single variable, which again is really not what you want, right? So the variable and assign operations also have to take place in this uh, session. So this is what our API looks like. I'll skip over some of the details. This is uh, tensor ref, which is like tensor value. It's a named thing that's been fixed, but uh, it's now like a thing that's stateful. And so variable basically gives us this named stateful node in the graph. And we also have control node, which is basically a node that doesn't have any outputs, like a sign. And uh, so assigning a variable to a tensor gives, basically creates a new name node. And so now we can say bind V to the variable, A to assigning that variable, W to another variable, B to assigning that variable, and run those to assigns. And that's now a different thing than say, binding V to some variable, assigning it, and maybe running it twice. So this is sort of uh, a difference between TensorFlow and other data flow uh, kind of computational frameworks where it builds these sort of stateful things directly into it. And so we need to make our API more complicated. Uh, so when you call run, as I saw on the like initial examples, it does this naming for you. Like if you have the expression 21 plus 42, that's an unnamed thing. Those are sort of abstract nodes. And run will take that, assign names to them recursively to the add node and to the two constant nodes that it depends on, and then go and run it and fetch the result. Uh, in some cases, you do want to do this explicitly. So we have a render function, which takes the unnamed tensor build and produces the named uh, tensor value. And we also add, uh, have functions which are sort of agnostic to whether they take named or unnamed things. So the add function takes a uh, tensor v and a tensor v prime where the parameter v means it can either be rendered or unrendered and it'll just do the right thing for you. So you can uh, say, take the two constant nodes, render them to x and y, and then uh, render the result. Or you can just render the full unrendered thing, or you can render one node, not render the other node, mix them together, and it'll all produce the same uh, result. So this is sort of how we kind of mix up, yeah. Do you ever need to know the name of a node? Uh, sometimes. So as an example, when you're doing automatic differentiation, uh, you want to make sure that like, you're re referencing a node somewhere in the, in the midst of the graph. And so it really matters that you're referencing that thing specifically, not something else. That's one of the main places. Is there another question? Okay, so how does this actually work? How do we actually mix these two uh, kind of worlds? Well, so the trick, which uh, is, so the trick is basically we, when you render a tensor, you don't always gender a unique, uh, generate a unique name for it. If you first check, has this node already been rendered? And if, or has something identical to it already been rendered? And if so, just return that name. So for example, if you have the uh, expression 42 plus 17, which is just three nodes, and uh, you have uh, another uh, node 42 plus 17, and you render their multiplication, then, uh, sorry, I just realized that this uh, graph that I drew is problematic. Uh, it doesn't match the example. Uh, but, uh, but basically, the idea is that imagine, uh, so now x and y will share the same names. So they'll feed into the same operation. And so the first two, exam first two let x equal, let y equals, and let x equal, by Haskell will have to be the same thing. So the only thing we can do is just render them to the same name. And so this is functionally equivalent to if you just rendered x and then rendered y separately, the separate explicit render call will then look up in the internal, in our internal state, notice that something like that has already been rendered and just return that name instead. So now we get something which is actually safe, the Haskell optimizer can't do anything to us and uh, we're uh, kind of get good results and hopefully mix these, uh, like or we're still allowed to write these pure expressions and mix them with the stateful ones. So before I move on, any questions? Okay. So the other topic I want to talk about with this overall API is how we actually type the values inside the tensors. So there's a generic class tensor type, which covers all of the uh, 10 or so types that TensorFlow allows to be in a tensor. Uh, 
So like floats, doubles, signed integers, unsigned integers, booleans, byte strings, complex numbers, and a few others. And so as another example, the fill operation, so it just creates a tensor, a multidimensional array of a specific size where every element is filled to this, is set to the same value. So the shape, because it's a dimension, it has to be uh, in 64, but the value can be any valid uh, tensor fill type. And so the fill has like tensor type A to a tensor of N64 to a tensor of A to a tensor of A. So, but a lot of ops are even more restrictive. So say you're adding two tensors, there are some types for which that's okay and sometimes types for which that's not. Uh, it's okay to add two vectors of insert uh, floats, but not two uh, vectors of strings. I mean, there are some languages where it's okay to add two strings, but uh, TensorFlow is not one of them. Uh, and there's other ops that are even more restrictive, like sum, which takes a tensor or and reduces it along certain dimensions by adding up all, all those dimensions. So the parameter A, the first tensor, needs to be uh, something that can be added together, like an add. The second one, Ix, needs to be something that's a valid index. And so that can only be like in 32 or in 64. So we actually get from TensorFlow at code generation time the explicit list, like add can work on these types, sum can work on these types. Uh, so how do we, again, involve that in uh, our Haskell types so that we can get useful uh, type errors and type inference. So one way which we don't do is we could generate a separate class for every app. I've seen this for some other uh, findings where it works pretty well. So if you have the add operation, generate an add type class. And that has instances for N32, flow of all the things in the previous slide. Maybe for some generate a some X type class where you have like for N32 and 64, all those other things. Okay. And then add would be, for example, it would take anything of add type A, you could take a tensor of A, another tensor A, and produce another tensor of A. Uh, the problem comes when you try to build these expressions together. Uh, some add mol and all have different classes associated with them. Those classes kind of leak out into the type signature, which is not great because it reduces your ability to like write like kind of a black box expression. Uh, you could imagine maybe doing some deduplication between like maybe add type and mul type could be the same thing. Uh, but that's hard to do like in general. Like we just get these raw uh, lists. Uh, the tensorflow kernels can basically define whatever they want. So we like something that's a little more generic and reduces the kind of surface of the API somewhat. So what we do instead so is it yeah. differs between these different TensorFlow kernels. It's not like one one TensorFlow wide um, definition for like add. You're saying you get it at runtime. I'm, I'm, oh yes. So, so uh, what I mean is uh, at code generation time, uh, which is there's a function you can call which says give me a list of all the uh, kernels. And so when we're generating code, we link against the TensorFlow runtime and do that. Uh, then, I, then we like write a Haskell module, just a text file, and then compile that as part of the build process. So does that answer your question? Yeah. So we've defined this kind of constraint time function called one of. Uh, it uses quite a few uh, language extensions, which I know is a little controversial. Uh, it's maybe easier to see if you look at just how it's used. So the sum uh, function just takes uh, has these two type parameters, a and ix, and says a is one of this list n32, n64, float, et cetera, et cetera, and ix is one of n32 and n64. Okay. In general, this is tricky, if not impossible, to do in Haskell, because Haskell doesn't have a notion of untagged union like you have in, say, C or Rust. I mean, you can say some things either in n32 or n64 using the Haskell type either, but that's not the same thing. That's a uh, distinct type from n32 or n64. What you really want is some sort of constraint that it's either one or this other thing, this sort of uh, union. So we can't do it in general, but we can do it for TensorFlow because TensorFlow only has a fixed number of types. There may be 10 or 15, like there's in 32 and 64, flow, whatever. So when we actually write one of, what we really mean is an alias to the following constraint. It's a tensor type, and if it's one of in 32 and in 64, that means it's not any of the others. It's not float, it's not double, it's not by string, it's not bool. Uh, it's a little like long of a list, but it's finite. 
And uh, we can write down this not equal as, uh, there's a few different ways of doing this in Haskell. Uh, I won't go this into detail, but a uh, simple three line way is writing a type family, which is uh, with the constraint kinds extension. So this just says a not equal to b is a constraint that if you ever see, if the compiler ever sees that a not and b are actually the same type, like maybe they're both instantiated to something or some other constraint enforces them to be the same, then it will evaluate to a type error and the compiler will fail. And GHC even lets us produce this nice like type error. Uh, and if you can ever tell that they're not the same, like maybe one is a float and one is a double one, the compiler eventually figures this out, then it evaluates to the empty constraint, which just disappears. So maybe a uh, easier way to see this is with an example. So assume that there were only five tensor types, like in 32 and 64, double float and bool. So, and you had two functions, foo. Foo can take one of double float or n32, and bar can take one of float n32 or n64. And we just try to compose these two functions, okay? So what we would like is that the resulting type we should be able to write down is, it's one of the intersections, it's one of either float or n32, the shared between the two, okay? And you can actually write this, this is valid Haskell. And the way this works is that when you say foo is one of these things, what it really means is foo is a tensor type and it's not in 64 and it's not bool, and bar is a tensor type, and it's not double and it's not bool. So their composition inherits all those constraints and deduplicates the shared ones. So it's not a tensor type, it's not in 64, not double, not bool, which if you go back to uh, the thing we want, it uh, exactly matches up as the complement of the constraints. So when you write code, you write it as this one of, and the compiler, uh, will immediately turn it into these uh, not equal constraints. Uh, yeah. So can you break that by adding a tensor type instance to something else that doesn't make sense here? Uh, yes, so we all, there's a extra- so just don't do that. <laughs> yeah, there's also a little bit of extra stuff like it, uh, one of also expands to a check that these things that you pass in are also uh, tensor types. So that, well, that's what I'm saying. Like, okay, yeah. So, so uh, there's that in practice. There's an extra thing that here that says all these things are also tensor types. So, and usually that goes away immediately. But if you try to pass in like a Haskell string, then that will result in a compiler action. Cool. So if you if you write that and then you just call it here, whatever pass compiler whatever type is. Sorry, can you say that again? If you uh, if you use like colon t and JCI or or type all or something to ask the compiler what it inferred those types as. Will it give you that nice one of thing, or will it give you something very obviously? If you type like foo.bar, it'll give you the slightly hairier uh, not equal thing. Uh, and that, that also shows up in uh, type errors too. Uh, although, usually the type error, it tells you the, because we can uh, define the not equal, it'll tell you what the incorrect type is, and it'll tell you which expression that was bad with, so you can usually ignore the mess and. Uh, it's just like it's wrong here, figure it out. Yeah. Also, can't get, that, can't get that fancy custom error messages to. Yeah, uh, maybe we could even make it a little nicer. Like we could, uh, in this not equal, we could somehow plumb through the uh, that whole list and maybe the name of the thing. I'm not sure. Uh, it might make things too easy. Okay, so with that, I'll hand it over to Frederick to get the sample. Um, I'm not sure, like. Uh, what the general familiarity with like machine learning is. Um, I don't know, it's like a raise of hands if you like no basic neural network stuff. And if I should like, skip over. Alright, well, I'll spend all the time on it. Uh, so this is like a, a pretty simple example. The MNIST data set is you know from like the 80s or something. And the uh, basics is that you have these uh, 20 like 28 by 28 grayscale images of digits. And there's some examples of there. And the goal is to just, you know, given one of these images, try and guess what the what the digit is. So we're just trying to learn a function from a list of pixels to a digit. And uh, so for a neural network, uh, basically we'll constrain ourselves to like the function space where, you know, you're in this simple neural network. So you have a, the pixels will come in as this vector x. Uh, so you just have all the, all the pixels stacked up and then, the, the, hint, the hint layer 
the so the neural network is you sort of have a couple layers of neurons, and each of them is a linear combination of the previous layer, and then you up, apply a nonlinearity to it. Um, in this case, we're just going to be a max of the value in zero, and then yeah, you do a series of those, and then at the end, there's a in this case, we'll interpret the result as a probability distribution over the digits. So there'll be like 10 outputs, and uh, it'll be you know, scaled as a probability distribution. Um, and then this the whole thing is parameterized by, so, so basically, uh, the linear combinations, this boils down to a matrix multiply. So you take the, the input screen, you multiply by a matrix, and then you, know, you, you apply the max up, and then you do another matrix multiply, and then you do the softmax function, which rescales the vector to be a probability distribution. And the parameters are the two matrix things. So you have W and U, and the goal is to, uh, yeah. And, and the output is the distribution, and the goal is to maximize the probability of the correct uh, digits. So in your data, uh, your data set, you have you know, uh, an image, and then you have the correct digit, and so you want to further each of them and you kind of adjust the weights to make the correct digit more probable. Uh, I feel like I'm giving a terrible explanation, but. Where does the 200 come from? <laughs> Sorry? Where does the 200 come from? The 200, okay, so uh, you kind of arbitrarily fix how big you want your uh, your hidden layers to be. <laughs> and the bigger the, uh, the hidden layer is, the like more rep like representation power there is. And the more layers you have, you know, the, the more kinds of functions it can learn. Yeah, so in this case, it's just uh, the little one, the one in the middle, it shows three boxes, but uh, it, it would be 200 in this case. Um, let's see what else. Yeah, and then down here, uh, the, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know you need to explain the loss. But basically, you, yeah, you calculate kind of the, a loss that says if the probability of the correct digit was low, then you have more, uh, you have a higher loss than if it's, you know, probably the correct digit was high, then you have a lower loss. And the goal is to kind of adjust the weights so that the, the loss is as low as possible. And it's not possible to like solve this in a closed form, so you have to use an iterative algorithm like gradient descent. Um, does anybody have any questions for anyone? <laughs> Okay, uh, so I'm just gonna kind of walk through the code and show you the implementation. <clears throat> Is this uh, big enough for see, or should I let's see this more? Does that look good? Or? Okay. Um, the way the code is organized here is that we define a, a model class that kind of wraps all of the all the interactions you'd have with the model. So uh, you kind of create the model, and then there's a function on it that you can call, and you give it a a batch of images and a batch of the like the labels, which are the digits in this case, and then it'll do like one one iteration of training, and then it returns a summary thing, which I'll explain later. Uh, another operation is that you can Give it a batch of images and it will return a batch of predictions like what, what digit it thinks each image is and then the last one is kind of like to evaluate uh, how well the model does on some set data so you give it images and uh, the labels and it'll tell you like you know what the the, the percentage it got wrong um, so Yeah, um, and the types here, it's taking in just like the normal Haskell uh, vector of uh, word eights. So each of those is a pixel. Uh, it's a grayscale, so it's between uh, zero and 256. Um, and this code here, the, uh, right now we, we haven't found a nice like um, NumPy equivalent. And in the Python version, you basically pass in NumPy arrays to everything. Uh, for TensorFlow, we haven't found something uh, nice yet. If anybody has any like hints, that would be good. But so instead, we have our own uh, TensorData type, and we have some functions to 
encode various types into that and to decode them. Uh, so one of them is you can use the, the TensorFlow vector class. Um, and it works by you just give it, it's a, here it takes the, it's taking all of the example images and it's concatenating them together and then it's casting them to a float. And then it calls the encode tensor data to just turn that into a tensor with uh, the, the correct shape. Which is the best size and then like the number of pixels as rows. And then it's a similar story for the labels. And uh, this is the meat of the, the example. So this will create the, this will define the neural network and then the like code that, uh, yeah, the, defines the neural network and then the like uh, calls to training it and everything like that. So the first step is that we have to create the, uh, the placeholders. So we have the um, the TensorFlow like like data flow graph, and the the uh, instead of uh, having constant inputs like in a lot of the examples I you gave, instead every time we want to run it, we want to feed like different sets of images into it. And the placeholder op basically <laughs> just creates an op that if it is executed by TensorFlow it will fail. But then uh, TensorFlow gives it the ability to feed in a value. In, in place of a node. So uh, these will act as placeholders. And then when you run the graph, you'll say, I want to set the value of images to be equal to like the actual images array. So you don't have to worry about overlaps and batch, like the screen batch, right? So we don't, like, because in Python, like in Python TensorFlow, like we can run, we can mini batch over our batch, and we know there won't be any overlaps so that every Thing is seen at least once for a given iteration. Um, or, you mean like uh, you don't have to worry about saying the same example in multiple times? In yeah, multiple when you're mini batching. Um, I think it would be the same as Python. Like when you select your batch, you need to just be careful that you don't select the same thing twice. Right? Um, this is just defining the input and then. You haven't seen the code yet for how to mix batches. Yeah. But that's part of it, right? Like the variable batch size. That, that's why I was asking. Oh, so the batch size just says uh, how big each batch should be. And the, uh, so it's set to negative one here is so that you can, it's so that you can feed in batches of different sizes. Uh, and like when you evaluate the entire test set, you can just like, I give it the entire thing at once. Uh, yeah. Okay, and then, and then we define all of the variables, which are the like U and D from the slide. Uh, you just write the U and W. Uh, so there's a, <clears throat> yeah. So we initialize it basically uh, small random values and then we get the shape. So the kind of the input to the you know, little transform is the number of pixels and the output is going to be the pin size, which is 500. And then uh, initialized variable creates, creates a variable and then it kind of registers an initializer to set it equal to the, you know, the value given. Um, yeah. and, and the does work. And in the Python version, you create variables and you can register an initializer for them. And then there's a way to say, like run all initializers, and you have to do that before you start your training loop. In our API, we just automatically run them the first time uh, run is called after they're registered. So we create both of the variables, um, and then we just created like a, a list to keep track of all of the uh, the variables that are going to be trained on. And then we define the network. This is basically the same as the slide. You take the images, and you do a matrix multiply by the the weights for the first hidden layer, and then you apply the ReLU function, which is just the uh, max of zero. And then the result of that is uh, multiplied by the the weights for the next layer. Um, and we're not, not doing uh, the softmax here because uh, it's like kind of an optimization of TensorFlow where um, <clears throat> when you calculate the loss, there's like a, there's a lot of ops that combine multiple uh, operations together like in, in, into one kernel so it's uh, more performant. So it doesn't make sense to call a softmax. To make a prediction, all we do is we uh, look at the logits, which are kind of like the Unscaled probabilities for each digit. So whichever, uh, yeah, whichever index into the array has the highest number 
is the one that the network is predicting as being the most likely. So we do argmax, which gives you the, the index of the largest element. And then that will correspond to the digit. So if it's, you know, the zeroth index and that's digit zero, if it's, you know, the third index and it's digit three. The, uh, the second parameter here is the, the axis to do the max over. So you have to tell it, in this case, you have a matrix where each, each row is a different example. And you want to uh, make a prediction for each example. So you're, uh, you're, you're maxing over the, the second dimension. And uh, this is kind of worry right now. And hopefully, in, I think in the next version of GHC, we can probably just do something like, like in 32 and then not have this. But, uh, right now, you kind of have to, sometimes when you give it a scalar, you have to explicitly turn it into a TensorFlow scalar. And uh, the index types can be either in 32 or in 64. So you have to like, explicitly tell it what it is. Uh, it can be just configured where it is there now. Um, yeah, and then there's this code calculates the error rate. So what it does is it takes the predictions and then it compares them to the labels that were passed in as a placeholder. It just does equals, uh, and then you get a you know you get vectors of booleans. Then here it uh, casts them into floats, and it's able to like infer the type of that so you can specify it, and then it uh, and then. Then it takes the mean of that, which you know effectively gives you the accuracy, and then you do one minus to get the area. Um, final part is the training. So to do the training, we want to call this uh, function softmax plus entropy with logits, which like combines a number of things all together. Uh, and the inputs are the logits, and then the which are like kind of unscaled probability distributions, and then also the probability distributions that are like the targets. In this case, we just want to like assign a probability of one to the correct digit. So we take the labels, which are something like, you know, for example, three would be for the third digit. And we call the function one hot, which uh, turns it into a vector of the size you give it, which in this case would be like size 10. And then it puts a one in the, the, the index of the, a one only for the, the index you give it. So you end up with something like this. this. So that would be a probability distribution with probability one for the correct digit. Okay. And, then, and then that gives you the loss. Uh, and then we take the mean of all the different examples and then you get like a single loss number for the whole thing. Then to, uh, then to train the network, we create a, we create a con like a control node up that represents the, the gradient stem set. So it calculates the gradient all of the uh, variables with respect to the loss, and then it does uh, one step. And I can go over the gradient descent implementation if anyone's interested. Uh, that's about it. After that, there's uh, these functions down here that kind of just wire everything together. So this this takes uh, you know the a batch of images and a batch of labels. It encodes them into tensor data, and then it creates these uh, feed objects that say. The, uh, the images tensor should be fed to the, uh, the, the encoded batch. And the same thing for the labels. And then it calls run with feeds. So this is what actually uh, you know, executes the graph. So you, you give it uh, values that you want to feed into it. And then you also uh, give it the, like the list of values that you, list of tensors that you want to execute and get the values of. Train step is just a control node, uh, and so you get a, you know, you get unit result, and then summary tensor gives you just like the bytes of the summary. I'll explain that a little later. Um, but the inference is the same thing. You give it the, the like the predict tensor, and then you get you get back uh, the vector of, you know, the predictions as uh, word dates. Uh, same story for the array. Then the uh, the main function that drives everything is first we just load the data set. And then we run the create model to get the model editor. And then the, uh, the training would be very simple where you just basically loop and you repeatedly select batches and then you, you call train. Uh, but it's a bit more complicated since we want to do some, uh, some like diagnostics. So first we like, uh, yeah. The TensorFlow has some features where you can uh, log to a file and then they have like a nice dashboard where you can visualize the results over time because 
sometimes these things take like weeks to train and you want to let a, you want to be able to see what's going on inside of it. Uh, yeah, so this just selects a batch, it runs training, and then it gets the, the summary of all the diagnostics and then it, it logs them. And then uh, I'm also bringing this some stuff out to consult and the demo a little bit more fun. Then it uh, evaluates the, the test set to get the test error. And then uh, then we have this fun thing at the end where we, we loop over the test set and we're going to print out the uh, digits. So now I'll uh, show you what it looks like. Um, yeah, so when it's running, it keeps bringing out you know the tra current training error on each batch, so you can see it decreasing. Um, also, part of the reason I think this example is because it's really tiny and it trains in like twenty seconds or something like that. <laughs> yeah, most mostly it's decreasing. Uh, it's not getting the, the error for the entire like training set, it's giving it for different examples, so it kind of oscillates as it goes through different ones. Okay, and then, um, yeah, so this is like one of the digits bring printed out on the console, and it, you can see it gets correct. So it's got the seven, got seven, and then, you know, go through a couple of them and it's the right. If you go far enough, this isn't a very good model, so like, you know, this one it thinks it's a seven. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is like extremely simple. So. That's about it. Um, people are interested, I can go through more stuff. But just huh? Oh, yeah, I can show up to the board. Yeah, so this is. Oh, whoops, I, um, I double logged on one. Anyways, it would uh, look like. Uh, so this is an example. It printed for each time step, it, it, uh, it logged the error rate and the loss. And so you can do like nice graphs of that. And then you can you can log them into with different names, and then you can kind of like compare the the results of different settings and architectures and stuff like that. Yeah, so I guess I have a lot of questions about how this interacts with sort of TensorFlow's scalability features. Like I didn't see any mention of parameter servers here, but are you distributing variables over parameter servers that's supported or um, I, I didn't try it. I think uh, I think Greg has done it before. Yeah, no, we we, we ran the scale. What? We we did run the scale. We everything that TensorFlow has for bindings to is happening on the machines that don't really do much compute. So it's orchestration. And you have hundred machines that you control in one can. So it's, it's part of the. the yeah, there's like there's some common errors like you know you say with device you tell with device okay so you can control the GPU placement and stuff yeah, like that yeah, yeah. and you can tell it to like initialize from a safe checkpoint or something like that yeah we also that I didn't it seemed real careful yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, some of that stuff is a bit raw but sure. yeah, we get right better yeah, ideas about it but yeah like for example the Previous end, I, it's in this file right now. We need to like you know have have libraries with this stuff and more more advanced optimization techniques. Besides the type checking at compile time for the types of tensors, um, what other advantages are there to this approach over say using the Python API? Um, I, I guess I feel like this main one. Sometimes you know I feel like the, the course is quite nice because you use a lot of your normal possible advantages like the only compose functions in nice ways and um, I, I almost I didn't have enough time but I was trying to get an RNN example where you can use um, you know instead of having to use a static RNN function that's made for you uh, it boils down to just doing um, map a cube from like uh, the prelude like there's uh, you know basically using fold and some other stuff like that it already exists uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's a huge advantage, but I think it's nice to have the, yeah. the tapes and some of the stuff. Like nice. yeah. So is that the equivalent to scan then? And the type <clears throat> like you use scan and it like builds up? Yeah, yeah it's pretty similar. There's, um, th there's another combinator in Pascal. I think it's called Mapacum L or something like that. It's like a slightly closer, but it's a very similar scan. Yeah. 
Can you go back to the type of model? Um, yeah. Actually, really, good. Um, that's an awesome type. I wish I had that. And that's great. <laughs> um, in something like infer, uh, what, what if your predictions? Uh, that's just a, a TensorFlow vector of the index that or the, the digit that it predicts, or is this some degree of certainty? Um, that's the, just the index. It's not the distribution. You could you could have that. This isn't actually a TensorFlow vector. This is just uh, yeah, data this data vector. Yeah. Um, you you could expose the like tensor data or something, but instead, okay. you expose control operations like tf dot Um I think the I think the the primitive kernels are like interframe and some other like lower level stuff, and we haven't built like a the control flow library on top of it yet. We would need to build that into the session itself to be like kind of there's some stuff that's built like low level stuff that bookkeeping needs to do when right. it's creating those to then they let live in certain contexts. Yeah. If you want to do big RNNs efficiently you'll need that to avoid the unrolling, right? But yeah. Yeah. So you want compiler just to compiler? Yeah. Which which However, which yes, version sure. of the compiler? Right now it's 710. 710. Yeah. And we have uh, stuff that works for each thing. I guess you said before, one interesting thing is this build, uh, this function is entirely, um, it doesn't interact with the C API at all. Uh, this entire thing is just building for buffs and manipulating them and stuff. And it's only when you Oh. Uh, run it in a session that uh, interacts with the TensorFlow API. That may change later. Uh, yeah. um, so Yeah, um, so the future work is, you know, we need to improve documentation. I think right now it's probably a bit hard to get started in the library uh, and just add more examples for more types of models. Um, we're also mixing, like, a very large part of TensorFlow is actually in Python. So there's a lot of Python API and uh, some other combinators and something that we need to build. Um, the, including the uh, automatic differentiation. So that's implemented almost entirely in Python. And right now we have our own implementation of it. Uh, we've only implemented for like a subset of the operations and we're missing some pretty important stuff like support for sparse tensors. So, uh, but well, the TensorFlow support for sparse tensors is pretty weak sauce too. So it's a little bar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit uh, improving the API, I think, and by some things that are a bit more challenging. But, yeah. what, is, what about support for GPUs? Um, yeah, we have support for GPUs. Do you have? Yeah. Oh. It, yeah, if your computer has, you, when you install this, you'll have to install the TensorFlow like, uh, library. And if you install the GPU version, it's automatically run the new one. Yeah.